Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Accelerated Mainline Linux Development ahead of SOC availability. That is a mouthful. Uh, my name is Brian. Um, before I begin, I, I really wanted to thank all the open source teams that we have at TI. Um, they, they really let me do the really cool stuff all day, every day, including giving this talk. Um, wrong direction. Uh, for those who haven't met me, my name is Brian Bratloff. I am a part of Texas Instruments uh, base port team. I primarily focus uh, a lot on the initial wake up of our SOCs. Um, so like bootloaders, Linux, uh, that's kind of my bread and butter day in and day out. Praneeth, uh, he is also a, a part of the Linux base port team here at TI. Uh, he's a, a big Android guy. He uh, maintains our product trees. Um, he's also uh, my manager. So he, he makes sure as I, I stay organized and focused on what I'm supposed to do. Um, at, he will be the, the first person to tell you I chase butterflies constantly. Um, unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. Um, so I'm going to try my absolute hardest not to let this fall off the rails. Um, so yeah. Uh, next slide. Yeah, this is please don't use this to get me in trouble. I don't like being in trouble. Um, okay, here we go. So um, if you can remember back into your student days, or maybe you're just starting to get into hacking, you know, you, teaching yourself, a, a project would look kind of like this, right? You're given some hardware, you find some hardware, it's really cool, it has absolutely no Linux support on it. So great, you get to write your Linux drivers and your software all by yourself. You know, maybe there's documentation, um, and hopefully it'll do something cool at the end. Um, you could be like me. Uh, you could find anyone and something else to write your drivers for you so you don't have to. Um, but eventually, you'll, you'll find someone, um, you'll, you'll get some assignment back, you'll, you'll start emailing Greg, um, get stuff merged, and you're like, hey, this is kind of cool, this is kind of fun, let's, let's see if I can make this into a career. So you start applying. You know, you, 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 find, you hear back from an SOC manufacturer and they, they're really excited to hear about you and want you to come on board. And then you quickly realize that that is not the model of how we develop SOCs. Um, so the, the development flow for an SOC kind of looks like this. There's a lot more stages than what we were when we were amateurs, right? Um, the, the main difference here is when we were amateurs or students, we only got access to the SOC after it was designed. Um, this, this means we only have a fraction of what we could do when, we, when we're inside the company, right? So we get to do things like influence the design process. But as a, as a student, you, the, the capabilities, the hardware capabilities dictated what you did in software. But when we're working with the manufacturer, we get access. Like, I know everyone's name in this, in, on all six stages of this. So we can, all, we can use that to our advantage to help it, uh, Linux evolve. Um, so I, I know this is kind of a new concept for, for some people working outside. Um, so I kind of wanted to go walk through the design process and kind of show people how we can design an SOC that comes with Linux support built in from the ground up. So the design process is pretty cy cyclical, right? Um, so the lessons learned from a previous SOC will go into the next generation, right? It's also a very creative process. So even though I, I lay it out in like a nice circle like this, uh, it, it is, you know, pieces in from one stage or going into the other stage and lessons learned from here or going there. So it's, it's a little bit more lively than a, a simple circle. But this, so anyway, okay, stage one. This is, the, the, this is where we generate the idea, right? Um, so we'll, we'll have support teams, but, oops, sorry, support teams, business leads. Um, they're working with the community constantly. They're working with our customers. They're combing through mailing lists. They're, they're, they're going through forums and they're trying to understand what people are having problems with or what do they want. How, and, and they're trying to find an opportunity that for, uh, for us to, to make a new chip. So things like, did customers have any pain points with you know, some component? What could we improve on? You know, if, if customers are having trouble with this component in, in our SOC, they're not gonna use it. 
So how can we make this easier? Um, things that you'll typically hear in this stage of a chip's life is like ease of use. How can I make this easier for, for our customers? So we also have system architects in this, in this stage. I, I call them architects. I don't know if that's their actual name, but um, they're, they're veteran embedded people. So they, they know the embedded ecosystem inside and out. Um, so they're, they're typically involved in this stage by checking out new IP, right? Um, so they're, making, they're working with IP vendors. They're, they're trying to find new components that we can add into our SOCs. And so they'll usually have like demo boards and FPGAs out, and they're trying to understand how Linux will behave if, they've, if we integrate this component into our chip. The, the critical part of this design process for me is that step, right? So it, it speaks to the maintainability of our IPs. Uh, the level of interest that these IP vendors have in supporting this component um, especially if it's like an upstream friendly uh, company, they're, they're really actively engaged. That tells us a lot about how dedicated the vendor is at supporting this, which ultimately goes to the longevity of that component. The last thing you would want is, you know, uh, some, some component requires some cryptic firmware that, you know, may get support for two or three more years only for them to renege, and now we've got dead IP in our SOC. So this is a critical, compo a critical step in, in, in my belief because it really gives the, 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 the longevity of these chips meaning. Um, so once we've kind of got a, a basic idea of what we're gonna do, right? Well, we have IP blocks selected, boot architectures, low power modes, key performance indicators, um, a market segment that we're going after, uh, we'll, we'll start bringing in the larger people, um, more people into, into the, the project, right? So we're, we're thinking about details at this point. How, will the, how, when we integrate all these IPs, will it function correctly? Uh, this is another critical com part of the design phase, really, because it means we have our domain experts here. They have a, a working relationship with the subsystem maintainer, right? They know the, the subsystem inside and out. And so they know what to look for in this design phase when we're looking at all the details of this SOC. So this is where we flesh out um, how these IP blocks are in integrated too, right? So we're, we're looking at the clock tree, we're looking at power domains, uh, you know, estimating resources that we're gonna need for this IP block, interrupt lines, what, what are we going to need to make this IP work with the Linux subsystem? The goal here is to have the team trying to catch errors, right? Um, most, of the, most of the hardware team, you know, they, they work in hardware. They don't know the Linux subsystem. So it's simple things like tying uh, the Cortex application cores to our C7X or our digital signal processors. That's a great idea because it saves on a PLL, but, you know, that's not great if you want C states. So, you know, this is the kind of things that we're catching here. And so once we have a solid plan, you know, we've, we've fleshed out all the details, we think like we can execute on this, we'll move on to my absolute favorite part, which is actually developing and validating the chip. Um, here our hardware design teams get the okay to start writing all, all the Verilog, you know, integrating all the, all the components. Um, they'll, they'll validate each component, I, I call that kind of unit tests. Um, and eventually we'll have enough to start uh, software development. And then we can start validating our software on this component. So how do we do this? So for new IP blocks, um, or, or, or changes in how we're integrating the IP that require a lot of refactoring to a driver, you know, we're, we, we switch an idea around and so now the assumptions for our driver are completely broken. So we, we need to iterate on some code. Uh, we can use VLAB by, for this. Um, I, it's, it's a company, ASTC, the Australian Semiconductor Technology Company. Um, I, I really, I think of them as QEMU for SOCs, right? Um, it's a software simulation, and, and because it's a software simulation, we can run this at our desks, which is really, really cool. Um, it allows us to quickly iterate on, on a boot architecture or design. Um, so yeah, VLAB is perfect for uh, boot flows that come um, from like a chassis change or you know anything like a big IP change. 
And because it's a simulation, uh, we can produce and iterate on our software very, very quickly. This also means that we can give feedback to our hardware teams. Hey, this isn't working out, can we do this? Or hey, this is, this is really working, let's kind of lean into this. And that allows us to quickly change our code again as these updates come, come back from the hardware team. So we're constantly updating this model as we're developing. And so the software and the hardware team are working together at this phase to develop everything that we need to. And so, uh, so there are also times where we want to be cycle accurate, right? Uh, VLAB is great for simulation, but it's, it's a simulation. Um, so to, to get some cycle accuracy, we use FPGAs. And unfortunately, these aren't something we can put on our desks. I mean, these are absolutely massive. I wish I could convey the size. Um, these, these, this equipment has billions of gates. Um, they're capable of modeling the entire SOC. And, and because they're the size of the rooms, I mean, they're a shared resource. And, but it allows us to do cool things like um, we can learn about and understand the performance numbers. So the, the K, key performance indicator, KPI, uh, we can expect from, um, from Linux. Uh, so um, so I, I work a lot with DDR. So things like DDR access latency is very important to me. So like, how long does it take a transaction to come from the Cortex-A cores to DDR and back? That, that is hugely important to me, and it's something that we can model in our FPGAs. Um, all of it can be calculated, but it's, it, at that point, it's still an estimation. Being able to run cyclic tests on an RT kernel, that is what's going to give us good performance numbers, and we can take that and show that, and like, hey, this is, this is what we can expect. This is also a great time to find bugs, right? So we're great integrating new IP. We have, you know, we're exercising drivers in ways that we didn't really think we were going to. And so this is a great time for us to find like small bugs in, in our existing IP. Um, so fortunately at this point, a lot of our existing drivers are already upstreamed. This means we can send patches out immediately. Um, and this greatly reduces our, our workload that we have once we get into the later phases of waking up a chip. Um, so we, we do start seeing a few bugs and like, okay, well, let's send a patch. And so that's, that's a, a great way for us to offload a lot of the burden. Um, there are limitations though, right? So I, I've talked about VLAB, which is a simulation and FPGAs. And so there, there are things that have analog components in the SOC. Uh, think FIs. Um, so they, unfortunately, they can't be modeled with a, or there's more things that can't be modeled with an FPGA. So those components will have to wait. Um, but the entire point of this, that, that validation phase is uh, to make sure that the software team has confidence in, in the chip and the software that we have. And it'll, and it'll, um, it'll behave in, the expected ways or in, in, in ways that satisfy everything that we laid out in the uh, initial idea phase. Um, this means that the, the, the later stages of the, the, the validate stage, really, um, will have Linux booting and running uh, for a while nine as we exercise each component. Uh, there are some variations to how we do this. I, I should probably add that. Um, for, for simple things like um, adding a DSP to an AM62, right? We, we want a digital signal processor. It might need a new DDR controller. Um, the, the cycle is much quicker because it's not as complicated, at least for us. It, it's not as complicated. But there are cer certain situations. You have a complete chassis change, a new boot architecture, a new boot ROM. Um, where this, you know, all these dates will kind of shift around accordingly. Um, however, once we're happy with the hardware design, we're confident in the design, um, we're confident that we can support it, that we, the Linux team, can support it, we can start sending out the, the hardware design out to the manufacturer. So we can start with tape out. Uh, however, we're not done here, right? Um, so we've made the SOC, um, but now we need to start working with the board design teams, right? Uh, we, we use these boards to showcase what you can do. They're, they're a template, right? How do you lay out DDR? What kind of PMIX should you use? All these supporting components are also very critical to a, a working Linux system. 
so this is where we begin working with our analog counterparts, right? Um, you know, they have PMIX they, they need to upstream. They've got drivers that they have to do. Um, this is also where they can come and ask us and we can go and work with them to make sure that, that the PMIC will work in a Linux friendly way. I mean, these, these PMICs are basically tailor made to work with our chips. Why would you make it hard to support Linux at this point? So we're also, we're also working with our em embedded engineers, um, our, our electrical engineers, our analog components um, teams to, to really support this chip um, so that when, when you go to make your own uh, solution, you can, you can rest assured that these components will have great support they'll, and they'll be great at um, supporting Linux. Uh -huh. Oh no. My computer locked up. That's unfortunate. <laughs> Worst nightmare. Um, okay, so, well, you don't get to watch the, the red letters move around. Okay, so, wrap up. <laughs> so, once we get the SOCs back, we, we usually get some early samples, blind samples that don't have any trimming, right? We can marry those with the boards, and that is when Wake Up officially starts. We have a somewhat functioning SOC. So we can start testing every single component. And this is where the bulk of TI patches that you see come from, right? We're, we're checking out each component. It works. A lot of this existing IP is already there, but there's going to be new components, a new DDR controller, a, a new way, a new remote core all that kind of stuff. But the majority of this has already been taken care of. Um, a lot of the previous stages that we've done, we, we already have Linux running, we know what we're doing. And so it's, it's basically documentation and device trees at this point. Um, and then once, we're, once we get the majority of, or basically all of it, um, upstreamed, it, it now becomes an easy thing. It's, it's support, right? So people are gonna start integrating this. Um, they're going to start using um, a chip in a way that we didn't intend it to. Uh, so they're going to be more bugs, right? Your subsystems are going to change. There's always going to be support. And so at that point, we're just maintaining. And so as long as we keep this working in upstream, we, we, I think we, we say 10 years, um, this is going to be a, an easy process because everything we're working in the community and so we get the maintenance burden for free here but we can work with our customers as well like you know we're, they're going to find bugs uh, think of rata workarounds uh, we can work with them to work on that um, and to fix that and that feeds right back into our idea right why did our customer have to find this errata themselves why why did you know all this kind of stuff all feeds back into the the design um, and so the I guess the number one thing is even though we say we're software developers uh, the, the the support system is through and through to make a functioning SOC that supports Linux it's not just software um, yeah and I guess that's kind of everything I had um, I really wish I could show you this ending slide, um, but uh, Praneeth and I are pretty active on email. Uh, we uh, we're also on IRC, so uh, Linux uh, Linux slash TI um, on LibreChat. Uh, we're always online. We're pretty active. So if you have any questions, come come ask. And thank you guys. We have time for questions, so maybe you have time to reduce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do that. What is most uh, interesting in uh, this process is uh, how do you make sure that uh, your software simulation uh, indeed simulate your uh, software? With KMO, you need to write uh, separate code. Uh, what, uh, how do you talk with uh, this wheel up? Yeah, so um, they, they use uh, system C, um, and so that is another concern, you know, that there could be a bug in the model. And so that's why uh, the validation step for us is, is kind of important. 
uh, we'll, we'll usually find the, these bugs, um, but then tracking it down. Is it, is it a, a, an error in uh, the VLAB model, or is it an error in our hardware, or is it an error in our software? That is, that is kind of a harder thing to do. Wake up, support, yeah. Um, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, thank you, Texas Instruments and the Linux Foundation. Um, I wouldn't be able to do this without them, so uh, thank you, guys. And then, yeah, here, here's all the stuff. <laughs> At what point in the process do you start submitting patches for drivers for those new controllers or peripherals? So one of the, the big rules that we have just internally is we want to have at least a rough draft of the um, um, technical reference manual. Um, it really gives our maintainers something to look at if they have any questions. And so any of the new con IP or new controllers, that, that'll be on the wake up step after we've gone through tape out. Um, but a lot of the existing IP, it's um, like I can think of like an RTC. Like we've integrated an RTC in the AM65. It had an errata workaround. And then and in simulation, it didn't. And so I felt very confident, like, OK, I can send this and fix that real quick. So maybe you can also elaborate a little bit also uh, for others on the market how you got to this upstream first process. I guess it was a process coming from the classical idea of uh, BSP first. So what did you do to convince management about that? Or did you get uh, feedback on that and things like this? So how could this be a role model for others as well? So I absolutely lucked out when I joined TI when I did, because uh, Nishanth did most of the heavy lifting sitting behind you for this. <laughs> so we made mistakes, a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> that was the hard way to learn, right? And this is kind of a, this is why we are making this presentation, because we, we know that there's a lot of people creating their resources. Great, good job. We also know that there are SOC vendors who have made the same mistakes that we did years back. I come from OMAP, and if you remember OMAP 3, okay, let's not go there, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so the big thing that we figured out was value for customers. Um, once we started seeing the pain from customers in terms of long-term long sustenance, we collected every single feedback that we had, listed them all out, and we fed that back into our management chain. None of our management chain wants to spend one cent unless it actually helps business, right? The business value is straight. If you have a chip that can only be supported for the next two years, you don't have a business. So what's the best way to do 10 years support? Upstream. It was, it was a straight, straightforward answer at that point. In fact, we got support to work with our IP vendors, our SOM vendors, everybody that we work with, with the same mentality, because we want these products to s sustain and stay uh, updated over the years. Hi, so what emulator are you using for TI? Ooh. Uh, and this is, this is one question, and uh, the second one, it will be like, uh, how long does it take to uh, validate the, on, on the emulator? Like, uh, yeah. I, I believe this is the uh, longest part because this is where you validate the, the hardware before <laughs> tape out. Okay, so first question, um, what, validate, or what emulators are we using? Um, I will say that there are two companies, and if you choose one, I will say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then for uh, simulation or uh, emulation and how long it takes, uh, that can really depend, right? Um, so like some new chips that I'm really excited about that I cannot talk about um, are taking a little bit longer, right? Uh, th there's just the, the number of things that have changed um, are, are, are going to take some time to look at. Um, 
But the smaller ones, you know, they'll definitely, um, like, like the AM62A that I was giving an example for, basically we just bolted on a DSP, um, our C7X, and a bigger DDR controller. That, that took a substantial um, smaller amount, six months maybe, yeah. So if you're looking from a boot time perspective, for example, a Linux boot, a complete, full-fledged ROM boot kind of scenario, uh, just to give you kind of a roundabout thing, one of the, the fastest FPGA among the two uh, emulates around an hour uh, for 6.2 for around a minute of real world time to get to your shell, for example. And this is a stripped down kernel. Yeah, it, y you find other things to do once you hit the run button. <laughs> What's the turnaround time at the VLAB stage? So you, say you find something, some a bug in, or something you want to have changed to work better with Linux, and how long does it take for a change in the hardware to feed back into the loop? So it's actually really fast. So our hard, hardware teams have a lot of scripting as well. Um, so if we find a bug in the hardware, they, it's usually within a day or two that the, they can get something fixed. Um, it, it depends on what the, the fix is. Um, VLAB, so basically we'll get updates every day, we'll in integrate this new model, we'll download it, um, and then, uh, yeah, and so VLAB is, is much faster than, than uh, emulation, but it's, you know, 1.5 times as, like, as slow, if that makes sense. I should probably use division, so it's like 33% or whatever that is. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thanks. <laughs>